tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is Leonard Stern and artist Chris Burden. Leonard Stern was born and raised in New York. He went to NYU, where he must have learned to write and direct, because he's created TV shows, and he's written and directed TV series and motion pictures. He's even won three Emmys, two Golden Globes, among all these other kinds of awards, Golden uh, uh, Writers Guild, Academy of Television and Science. Can we take a quick run through your career? Oh, <laughs> Where if did you it would start? like. It, uh, <laughs> it'll be uphill again, I guess. Yeah. Yes, all right, surely. We see all of the things that you were associated with on late night TV, like Get Smart, The Jackie Gleason Show. Uh, yes, been very. Steve very, Allen. Mm hmm. So let, let's talk sure. a little bit of uh, Bilko show, right. Sergeant Bilko, mm -hmm. my favorite. <laughs> what did you have to do with uh, these I, I, I started out, uh, John, as a, as a writer. I started in television uh, writing The Honeymooners, and I did that for four years. Then I wrote Sergeant Bilko for a year, and then I became the head writer and director of The Steve Allen Show. Uh, and then that led me back to California and uh, where I worked on uh, Get Smart. So that's where you did all of these things in New York? They were in New York, yes. Uh, California had virtually closed down when television first reared what they thought was its ugly and frightening head. Oh. And so the production uh, was nil, and I went back east to look for work, and I was very fortunate to get the honeymoon. It was remarkable on-the-job training. But you were very young then. That was like yeah. the beginning of... Yes. Yeah. Well, I started as screenwriter. I was very lucky. on Abbott Costello movies and I was 20. <gasps> Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I even remember those. Those oh, yes, were very I, good. I, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you think about all these people as being so funny, but they wouldn't be funny without Leonard Stearns. Well, bless you. No, but isn't that well, what it, happened? It is very true. Uh, there was uh, more, much more of a reliance upon writers in the earlier days than there is today. Most comedians today uh, write their own material. This may account for the decline in comedy. <laughs> I don't know, yes. Uh, maybe but, a very prejudiced point of view. But no. did, did you used to sit around, say, with uh, Jackie Gleason and talk about what, how, what the, the concept was going to be? Well, he was unique. Uh, he didn't like to look at anything until the morning of the broadcast or the night before at the earliest. He had total recall. And because it took almost a full week to write the show, he seldom saw the script with uh, more than six or seven hours to prepare. Is that right? And, and so he could do it? He could do it. He had total recall. Art Carney and Audrey Meadows would pick up the pages as we finished them. They were that good too? Well, they were. They, they, they protected themselves a little. They took the pages each and every I night. See, I see. Well, and, through yes, the five the days five, of right. writing them. And I Audrey see. was the monitor of the show. If, uh, if they didn't remember a line, they never stepped out of character, but Jackie did a lot of pacing and Art did a lot of this <laughs> <laughs> until she found a way of telling them where they had to go, yes. And then how different was it when you were working with, say, uh, Sergeant Bilko? Well, uh, uh, there Nat Hyken was the guiding genius and that was very well rehearsed. S and Phil Silver. Phil right? Silver show and that was precision. Also, it was acute timing there because Phil had a remarkable delivery that was dependent on a cadence and it was sort of orchestrating the dialogue. That gets me to, do you write the dialogue in that kind of cadence? Are you thinking about that as you're yeah, doing you it? Yeah, you always write uh, for the performer if you, they have a distinctive style and, and you can hear their unique rhythms. I, I did a script, a movie script for George Burns and, and George paid me, I guess, the ultimate compliment. He said, I'm not going to have to change a line, but how did you know my daughter? I said, I was weaned on hearing you on radio. Yeah, so and then it was you so knew. specific, yes. Then you kind of left, well, I don't know if you left comedy, but was Macmillan and Wife or the Governor and J.J. comedy? Yeah, Governor and J.J. was a, a sort of a, you might call it a sophisticated comedy or, or a 
commentary, com com comedy commentary. Macmillan and White was pure mystery with a, uh, a humorous uh, uh, side to it. The relationship was humorous well, how and their is, perceptions of life, yeah. How is that different then, not r writing, so to speak, one-liners that were going to make a person it's stand in, out? It's a good question because I wondered at one time, why was it easy for me to go from comedy to mystery? And the answer occurred many, many years later, uh, way beyond the time I had given myself to answer it. Uh, a comedy and a, uh, a joke and a mystery are very much the same ingredients. You mislead, you surprise with oh. the ending, and so uh, it's an encapsulated mystery so in my a, mind, the joke. A yeah. little bit of a formula mm -hmm. that you're thinking yeah, about, but you just put yeah, different... Or, right, you program yourself like a computer, I imagine. Yeah. Well, going from TV, I have, I have your whole life to cover here. <laughs> oh, yeah, so sorry. I'm like jumping uh, around, going uh, from, from my... TV to motion pictures. Yeah, so you I, wrote for... yeah I went back and I started, started as a screenwriter. And then, as I told you, the business... Uh, disappeared and I went back and did television and then I alternated between the two when I came out here. Uh, I but would you go did some interesting motion pictures. Yeah, I, I, well, I, well, I, I, cho <laughs> I, cho I, I choose to think so, yes. Of course, the early ones, I was very, for I don't even know how I got the job looking back. Uh, retrospective view, I was lucky. I was fortunate to be guided when I was at Universal by a remarkable man, a story editor named Ray Corset, who was a paternal figure. And he uh, made you conscious and aware of beginnings, middles, and ends. You had to be able to tell a story. Do the people still do that when they teach classes anymore? I don't even hear people say you, you need a beginning, middle, and end anymore. They just start I and... You're, you're perfectly right. There was a time, they abandoned the form. And I think you have to know the form before you violate it or, or, or abandon it. It's, yeah. a, it's like a painter. He has mm -hmm. to know how to paint yeah, before absolutely. he can uh, paint abstract or paint whatever is in his mind. He has to have the, the tools. Well, you, you see, it's affecting everything. The songs today don't have inner rhymes. And I think we were weaned on that type of right. wit and a, a subtle commentary. Right. Yeah. Um, you were the president of the Producers Guild, right? This I think for most of my life, it seems, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't want to say how many years. Eleven. But what, what does a president do? How do you, uh, what a, is your job? In the Producers Guild, it was getting the guild uh, recognition. Unlike the Screen Actors Guild, the Screen Directors Guild, and the Screen Writers Guild, uh, the uh, Producers Guild uh, did not have a minimum basic agreement. And without that, they don't have the power to strike oh, or um, uh, demand, make demands of the studio. So everything has to be done through dialogue. So it's a very involved uh, position. And um, right now, the Guild is probably exhibiting its greatest strength and cohesion, and is now led by Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, oh, a remarkably gifted producer. Were you also in the Writers Guild? Because yes. you were writing at that yeah, time. Yes, I, I was a member of the Writers Guild, and I, I, I was involved in, the, at one time, Writers Guild shows were the best ticket in town, and I wrote and directed and produced one of those with other writers uh, on the uh, writing assignments. And unfortunately, they don't do them anymore. It was exhilarating. They were, <laughs> yeah. Sometime in here, uh, during being president or doing something, you founded a publishing house, Price, Stern, and Sloan, which was yeah. very well-known publishing house. Yeah, we, we were very fortunate. That happened by an accident. Uh, initially, Roger Price, who was a very dear friend of mine and a unique thinker. In fact, I dedicated a book to Roger in which I said he was one of a kind of which there was no kind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he and I had come up with a concept for a game, a word game, but we had no name for it. And five years later, by accident, I think we were at, at uh, dinner at Saudi's, and somebody said, meant to say uh, uh, ad lib, and said mad lib. And we said, oh my goodness, that works, mad libs. That's what these words, this word game is. Oh. And so we went then around trying to sell Mad Libs to publishers, and publishers told us it was a game, and sent us to game manufacturers, and game manufacturers told us uh, it was a, a book. And eventually Roger and I published it, and it took off. 
You, you I, had to do it yourself because yes, no one else uh, would do it, right. I guess. And Larry Sloan, who's a dear and old friend and went to school, high school with me in college, uh, Larry was a publicist then, and he had ideas and ways of promoting the book and the company. And he ultimately built it into the large company it was, and I think we... Uh, Oh, we published uh, over 200 titles a year. I was going to say, what kind of books then did you publish? Kind of whimsical? Uh, we had a, a, a humor division. And we were, <laughs> humor, yeah, whimsical. Yeah, well, it's the same. It, it, that qualifies. <laughs> and we also uh, had um, uh, um, children's books. We were very well represented in children's books. We had uh, We Sing as a special division, which was children's musicals. Uh, we um, did cookbooks. We, ha we were rather an extensive uh, uh, full-service uh, publishing house. How long uh, did that company Over last? 30 years. Oh, it was 30 years yeah. old? Mm -hmm. We sold it to uh, Putnam uh, seven years ago. Oh, I didn't realize yeah, that. So you were the... working on it all this well, time? Well, Larry was the primary force, and uh, Roger and I were the, were the dilettantes. We, we surfaced every once in a while and took some credit. Oh. But in the last uh, dozen or so years, uh, I got more involved in the, in the uh, Price Stone Sloan operation. And then when we sold it, we had to wait an obligatory five years before uh -huh. we could re-enter publishing, which we did two years ago with Tallfellow Press. So I missed my window of getting my whimsical photographs published in no, at no, Price Stone. Tall, tall, Tallfellow is very receptive <laughs> to good ideas <laughs> so and ta mischief. So Tallfellow then, is a new company, right. mm -hmm. and you started it with with Larry Sloan. Roger died. Ah, uh, uh, so the 10 two of you. Ago. So your same old partners same are back old, again. Uh, yes, and Roger's spirit is there. Most assuredly. Yes. And you have Tall Fellow Press mm -hmm. and Small Fellow Press. Small Fellow is the children's <laughs> division, and it's run by Lois Sarkazian. Uh, who has a lovely shop here. Every picture tells a story. Is she the bookstore on Beverly yes, Boulevard? Yes, right, right. Oh. So she's part of with us, and uh, uh, we have my uh, daughter-in-law working with us, Laura Stern, and we have Larry's daughter, Claudia. Oh, so, that's great. Uh, uh, yeah, so and, and the two, you brought back Droodles, which yes, well, was something Yeah, that's that homage to Roger uh, Droodles. Hand so it I, to me. I, I want to hold okay. it up. Okay. Thank you. Um, no. So this is one of the things you're doing. The other one is a Martian wouldn't say that. Do you want this? All right, you can have this okay, as well. I'll hold this one well, up you, too. I'll hold them both That's very noble of you. Thank you. But tell me about them. Well, Droodles is a uh, homage uh, to Roger. Roger created this back in the 50s, and there's never anything comparable to it. It's line drawings, and you have to... Uh, 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 guess what the title might be or give it your, the painting your own title. We call it, a, Roger, a maximum minimalist. Okay, so tell me this. Well, with, uh, without my glasses. Show it again. I'll tell you uh, what it is. Uh, all right, that's, it says, an early bird who caught a very strong worm. Well, and there you are. pulled yes. into the hole, right? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and that's the whole uh, concept. Was, there was no way who thought Roger's way. There's a, there's a square drawing in there, and that's a tennis ball, Factory Reject. You it's know, so it's, great. And then this is your latest book, The Martian. A, wouldn't say that. Wouldn't say that. That was a memo that was, Jimmy, you remember the show, My Favorite Martian? Sure. Jimmy Comack was the writer of All it. Right. And, and he got a letter telling him to change the dialogue on page 14. A Martian wouldn't say that. And it, it, we couldn't believe the note. He called me and said, you got to listen to this. I did. I laughed. And, and suddenly thought, let me look in my own file and see if I've got some memos. And that's how you put it together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jimmy because was, they're really, uh, he says, you finally have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But unfortunately, not in that order. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then here's a, in your rewrite, you've succeeded in Obfuscating, obfuscating, obfuscating the storyline with a plot. Yes, so, so you, you've changed the storyline with yeah, a plot. Yeah, you get you get very convoluted feeling, uh, uh, remembrances. Uh, I was looking for one that I got on a show I loved. Uh, he and she, and uh, we were inordinately proud of it. And then I got this frightening memo: "We're canceling your program as of the 17th of next month. That allows you four more episodes. Keep up the good work." <laughs> Great. Yeah. And I'm going to say keep up the good work. Oh, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very oh, my much. My pleasure. Thank Have you, a good Leonard. Time. And don't go away because we'll be right back with artist Chris Burden.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with artist Chris Burden, who was born in Boston, Massachusetts. He earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Pomona College in Claremont and a Master's of Fine Arts from UC Irvine. Chris has had one-man shows from coast to coast as well as all over Europe and Asia. He creates installations and uh, his, his main objective, or he's the main object, of his performance pieces, which I guess he's stopped doing in the last few years. He's received many, many awards, uh, especially four grants from the National Endowment of the Arts. And for the last 25 years, you've been teaching at UCLA, or close yeah. to 25 years, in a new genre. That's what it's called. What is that? Uh, it's everything that's not traditional painting, sculpture, printmaking. So it's all the sort of newer media. Did you create it? or No, it was originally called New Forms and Concepts. And uh, at the time, uh, the NEA had a category called New Genre, which was video, performance, installation. So the faculty felt we should call it New Genre so to standardize the name. But is there a certain qualification to get into your type of genre classes? Well, at the graduate level, uh, we take two students in our little areas. Basically, the two tenured faculty are myself and Paul McCarthy. I see. And uh, uh, so we, we get to admit two graduate students. Well, do you interview them and look yeah, at them? I see. Yeah. So we have 100 applicants for two slots. But then, do they come in and do anything they want to do, or do you influence them from the way your art or your thinking is? Well, that's, <laughs> you have to ask them, <laughs> really. Uh, I mean, I, supposedly we influence them, and, uh, but really you'd have to ask them. I mean, uh, uh, they're pretty much on their own. I mean, once somebody's in graduate school, either they're uh, uh, working or they're not working. And uh, when I went to Irvine, for example, which I think is the way the program should be run, is we were told admission constituted a degree. So if you were admitted to the program, you would automatically get a degree. But does that mean because you've qualified so highly yes. to be admitted, or you yes. people have interviewed yeah. you and qualified? Yeah, well, well, we reject 98% right. of our applicants. We get 100 applicants. We take two people. <laughs> right. right? So, uh, um, so it really depends on the two teachers that are. It's, it it yes. depends on the professors who are doing it because yeah. you have to see what that artist we can do. We have to look do. at all the slides, and then you get down to six or seven, and then you kind of. Do you talk to them? Yeah, so you, you call see them up, and yeah. you talk to them if they're in, come by. You you, you mentioned uh, Irvine. It seemed like Pomona and Irvine were, uh, to me, yeah. and maybe the outside world, are very conservative kind of schools. Places. Well, they were. They weren't when I went there. It was one of those flukes. Uh, when I went to Pomona, uh, it was just sort of at the mid-60s, so it was just at the cusp, and they were trying to change and get it uh, with the times. I see. And when I went to Irvine, I mean, it's true that Orange County is known that way, but the art department was the first year they had a graduate program, and they were great uh, artists that were teachers there. There was Irwin. Uh, oh, conceptual. Yeah, Tony, Tony DeLapp, uh, Craig awesome. Kaufman, uh, oh. and... Uh, uh, a lot of people would be coming out from New York, so Barbara Rose would come out, and Bob Morris would come out, and so they uh, were way ahead yeah, of what yeah. was going on in other art yeah. schools. Yeah, and that was what your kind of thinking was. Is that yeah. why you ended up at yeah, Irvine? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you have had one man shows all over yeah. the world. I know. What do you show in those kind of shows? Do you show paintings? No, I don't. I've never made a painting in my life, which is pretty strange. I was able to go through. Uh, Four years of college and two years of graduate school. So the, never the, made a painting. So it's so you're a sculptor. We would uh, say. Yeah, I, I was trained as a sculptor. Yeah. And you've been in Sweden and Spain and Austria and England and uh, France. France, just Germany. just to name. I, yeah. I saw a yeah. show of yours in Germany, yeah. Yeah. which was an installation. So tell me what an installation is compared to not showing paintings or sculptures. Well, you can show paintings and it could be an installation too. So, yeah. uh, these definitions, but I, I guess an installation you think of as being in some way site specific and influenced by the architecture around it. That's what I would think. So it's not. And so is that what you do? Do you have a certain idea or do you, 
know that the museum space or the gallery space is going to be a certain way and then you build your installation to go with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, but well, recently I was back in New York and uh, my art dealer Larry Gagosian has a new gallery on, uh, in Chelsea on 24th Street and they want to do a one-man exhibition with me. And uh, it's all hypothetical in my mind until I actually see the space. So you don't even have any idea what you're going to do. You go there, didn't. and then that's what I was going to ask you. The space elicits uh, uh, a response. So, I mean, in a sense, there's a crossover to, into architecture. Did you study the, architecture? You know, I start. I started as a uh, as an architecture student, and uh, at Pomona College, I didn't have a specific architectural program, so you ended up taking physics courses and art courses. Oh, so you did. Um. And uh, um, I liked the art courses because um, I just didn't find great pleasure in, in, and other people do. So it's just a matter of sort of taste or what your inclination is. I remember my fellow students who, who were uh, physics sort of mm -hmm. um, students and, and they would get pleasure out of working on an algebra problem, you know, zero to the zero power for 40 hours. But in a way, the physics part is like, say, this construction that you've done here. It's like putting pieces together, yes. isn't it? Yes, yes. Tell me about this Well, piece. this is mechanical engineering. But still, right? it's spending time doing something, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but... Uh, you have to solve the problem to put the, make this bridge. I did. And, and, and what, tell us about it. Well, the, pr the problem I set for myself was, uh, could I make a... Uh, uh, this is a metal, uh, these parts are metal construction sets and they're called Erector in the United States and Meccano in Europe. And uh, the problem was could I build uh, a bridge that would support my own weight oh. out of this, this stuff, which is when you take an individual part, you can bend it in your fingers very easily. So but could you I, made your own problem. Yes. And I then did. you solved it. Right. And it took full six, seven weeks of fiddling around at a table. But you put every piece together, yeah. so that's the, the mechanics of the yes. whole thing that you're doing. It's trial and error. Did you do this for a certain project? Uh, well, I, I did an exhibition in Sweden a couple years ago. I see. And this was the, the first piece, sort of a finger warm-up, so to speak. And then I did a series of bridges, um, this being one of them. Uh, and the other ones are quite large, uh, the biggest one being uh, almost 30 feet long uh, out of this material. So, um, and that, that is a scale reproduction, different uh, parameters. And uh, for the Hell Gate Bridge, I was trying to make um, an accurate scale model, which is a very famous bridge in uh, Manhattan, a railroad bridge that was built in uh. 1913, I think. Uh, so, 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 did the bridges just come to you? Uh, oh, how do you no. Do, I mean, okay, this I'll tell you about the story. Is no, it? no. I, I uh, collect a lot of books, and uh, I, I collect books sometimes. I'll buy a book just for one image in the book. Uh, and there was a, uh, an image of a specific bridge in Mexico that was planned in 1860. And it was very, very beautiful. It went through a very deep gorge. And it had a sort of a running snake, a sort of a reverse arch that went through it. It was just a gorgeous thing. And I looked at that picture for about five years. I would take it out and stare at it. And I kept thinking, gosh, I wonder if I could make this. Because it was never built. It was just, a, and oh, all it was, it was just a drawing. It was just an engineer sketch, sort of. And I thought, God, this thing is so elegant, so magnificent. I wonder if I could actually build this out of, uh, you know, erector and mechano pieces. And so that, that's really what, so I thought about it for a long time. And then I built this one first. And then I went into the Mexican bridge, and then I built the Hell Gate. So it's not really whimsy. It's like a deep, a deep process that just yeah. comes to you. Yeah. During the, perf have you stopped doing performances? Yeah, I stopped. Ooh, I'm trying to think. Like say in seven, years ago? seventy-one, you yeah, did yeah. shoot, yeah. which was. Yeah. I'm going to go through just a couple of these yeah. performances, and you can tell us what you did. Like, <laughs> at, at well, you know, Joe. Shoot. Well, yeah. the, our my audience does right. it. Uh, shoot, uh, that's maybe one of the most famous ones. Uh, that was in 71, at about six months after getting out of graduate school. Uh, I had a friend shoot me in the, in the arm. And you, so how do you document it? Well, I had a little s 
eight millimeter film and uh, some still photographs. So is that the, that's the process? That's part of the art piece by the documentation, the the performance that took place. No, the documentation is just that. Oh, it, I it, see. it is. Uh, it does become an integral part because, of course, that's how. It, uh, the information usually gets disseminated right. through these photographs and, and a little text I write. Uh, then another piece in 1973 was the 747. Yeah, uh, that was, um, uh, uh, well it was right about the time when the hijacking started and it was a gesture of impotence actually. Uh, of you have no you can't do anything, right? right? And what basically what I did is I fired a very small handgun at a 747 taking off from the LA airport. Uh, and it is a, it's kind of a conceptual piece in the sense that um, the bullet can't even get to the plane. That's right. Uh, that's you know that's, what that's I'm the impotence. That's, I see that. So, so the fantasy is somebody's looking out the passenger window, they've escaped. Because the feeling of getting on a plane and leaving, the minute it takes off is you've escaped. And I lived on the Venice boardwalk. And all around me are these, you know, sort of street people drinking, and they're always complaining about the airplanes taking off. Oh, so you know, they, they look at those <laughs> people. Blah, blah, blah. So, so it's a kind of a, it's more of a fantasy that somebody looks up and they're taking off. Uh, I'm just telling you what con construct goes around That's the world. That's what I'm, yeah. And you know, and the, and you see a lone figure down on the beach, which of course you wouldn't see, but right. you know, and you look out and you see the bullet come up and try to make it and it, and it runs out of power and then it drops back down as you fly away. This is your, but that's your whole yeah. concept yeah. of the way you yeah. did it. Yeah. Um, I wasn't trying to shoot a plane out of no, the sky. No, no, <laughs> I know. So <laughs> that, that's why I wanted yeah. to just talk about some of these things because there are well thought out processes, processes, whatever. Um, how do you, before we finish, time yeah. comes to an yeah. end so fast. How do you keep on that edge of doing new things? Uh, boo. I mean, they seem always so new yeah. and no one else has thought of them. Joan, I, I have to be honest with you. It, uh, I have an active imagination. <laughs> and so the problem isn't thinking up new things, it's to edit the ones I've thought up. Oh, so you have so many things going through. Chris? You have to come back and tell us some of these things again. Okay. Thank you so you're, much you're for being <laughs> with me. Thank you for watching. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.